Hello guys, my guest today is John Midek. He is the host of the Sharpened Artist podcast. He is also a creator of the Sharpened Artist Academy. John is very passionate about teaching and podcasting. The topic of our conversation today is why artists don't make any money and um, uh, how we can. Um, we are going to discuss different income streams for artists and um, how you can become economically stable as an artist outside gallery system. I'm not suggesting that you should uh, stop looking for gallery representation. Um, I think if that's your goal, you must uh, follow that goal. It could be a very long period. When you keep on uh, networking and uh, trying to uh, get that gallery representation, but you have to sustain yourself. And so today we are going to discuss uh, strategies, uh, how to make money as an artist. And in this episode, we discuss reasons to enter or not to enter the art contests. We talk about the importance of uh, signing a photo release form. We also discuss how to turn your passion into real business. We discuss uh, teaching uh, mentorship opportunities. We also talk about the importance of consistency in doing anything really. And uh, we have fun discussing colored pencil uh, brands, surfaces, and teaching, and how it sustains us as uh, professional artists. Enjoy! Hooked on Art podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, and uh, YouTube. Hooked on Art podcast is one of the top 10 art collecting podcasts on the web, rated by Feedspot. <laughs> okay let's start then <laughs> okay uh, i'm happy to see you on my show <laughs> thank you veronica thanks for having me i really appreciate it <laughs> so and this is something i'm very passionate about and i love to talk about it now i'm not someone who can talk with any kind of credibility about working in a gallery system because mm -hmm. i've not done that Mm -hmm. And so what I do want to talk to you about today, uh, for those of you that, that may be stumbling across this or listening or following Veronica and her awesome uh, work she's doing over here in this channel, um, is I want to talk to you about how you can think about generating your own income as an artist. I, I think that there's a couple of things that hold us back, Veronica, when we start thinking about how, as an artist, how can I make money? And the biggest challenge that I see for artists is that they want to create something that is very siloed and is very uh, unitask oriented, if you want to use that expression. Like, for instance, I'm going to create artwork. Uh, hopefully it'll be good. Someone will notice it and then they'll want to buy it. You know, this is just very, it, it all goes back to mindset. That's just very limited mindset. And it's, it's not going to work. Uh, mm -hmm. my con I contend that it will not work. I think most artists just wait to be discovered. I admit I had the same mindset in the mm -hmm. beginning of uh, my studies. Yeah, but oh, I yeah. realized that very quickly that no one is going to discover you if you yeah. don't become seen somehow you gotta and, make them see you you gotta yeah. make, you've got to create that discoverability mm -hmm. and the, so the biggest thing i want to say about that is that you know that's that's a nice uh story that we could tell ourselves in our head but the reality is quite different and even for maybe a select few that maybe you have in your mind right now that you think oh you know they were discovered they probably weren't Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we can get all of that out of the way, then let's talk about some very strategic things mm -hmm. that you can do as an artist. First off, if you love creating art, then you want to figure out a way that you can create some type of lifestyle that fits within this goal of creating more art, something that 
you're passionate about something you enjoy doing every single day and then do more of that and then figure out what is some degrees of separation beyond creating this artwork that can generate money or create assets for you that will make money over and over again. One easy way and one that I'm uh, more qualified to talk about is teaching. The uh, second thing is we could talk about the ability to just go outside of some of your comfort zone and get in front of traffic so that you can create opportunities to sell your work independently. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we could talk about social media and things mm -hmm. like that. You've got to get in front of traffic. You don't create traffic. You get in front of traffic to be able to sell work mm -hmm. if you're wanting to sell work. And then we can talk about the origination of something. You create something very different. Like you created a book just like a couple of years ago, Veronica. If you do something that's different and you challenge yourself to figure out who you are, figure out what lights you up, figure out what you're really passionate about. And maybe it's not teaching. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching, but mm -hmm. maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you can't explain your process. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. So do something else. Um, one of those things is maybe you do know your process only, you know how to do your thing. Okay. So you can blog about it and you can uh, create uh, different clips of your process, put those on TikTok or YouTube or something like that. Uh, you can submit articles to magazines about your particular technique that you do. Also, then what you could do is you could package that up and teach that over a Zoom workshop. Those work mm -hmm. really well. All right. So let me back up for a second then and just mm -hmm. talk about teaching in particular. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think um, you can just uh, share your experience, like yep. what you love about teaching and how it evolved, because it's also a very big income stream. Uh, to be honest, like it, it was my major income stream uh, for life. Um, and I did a lot of teaching outside of my studio but then over time I figured that um, I was very efficient teaching in my studio only mm -hmm. so you can just share your experience and how you arrived at your teaching style and like okay. what you actually do uh, sure. to find and retain the students so I do like talking about teaching. It's something that I do now, um, but I don't just teach in one way. So mm -hmm. if, if you are interested and you're thinking about teaching, then I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to talk about my path and what happened, and then mm -hmm. I'll talk about the specific areas that I teach in today. Yeah, yeah. But first off, what I did was I was working a corporate job. I worked in IT, had several different roles through the years in IT. Uh, for 20 years. And I had this goal in mind that one day I was going to quit and I was going to create art. Um, and that started around year 10 ish, 15 ish, I don't know. And I started uh, creating art. I started trying to learn how to draw. I knew nothing. I knew nothing about art. And how, and, how uh, old were you? Oh, in my uh, late 30s, early 40s. Okay, because right, you right see, usually people say, oh, it's too late to do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I grew up in a very rural area in Oklahoma, and I did not have art classes mm -hmm. uh, at all. So when I'm, when I'm talking about blank slate, I was the epitome of blank slate. I knew nothing, but I came back to it and I wanted to learn uh, something about this. I, I love to create art. Don't get me wrong. As a child, mm -hmm. I was always creating art, but I didn't know what I was doing. It was just kind of blind, you know, just muddling my way through. When I came back and I started approaching this different with an analytical mind, mm -hmm. then I, I learned a lot about just the mechanics of what it takes to create art. And I learned that that really lit me up and I was so excited about it. And I wanted to share that excitement and that passion with other artists. As I started learning, I thought oh, I could help somebody understand so, the things that they don't know right now. How did you study? Like, 
um, some artists are self-taught and just you know copied art uh, of others Right. Uh, others, you know, went to school. Like, how did you start? Uh, okay, so yeah, I didn't. I didn't go to school for it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I did not study it uh, in that way, in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you could use that label, self-taught. You know, but mm -hmm. I gobbled up every book I could get a hold of. I watched YouTube videos, mm -hmm. even if they were horrible. I watched and read everything I could uh, to figure out, you know, what they knew that I didn't know. And I, I learned a lot just by doing that and mm -hmm. by practicing, just by trial and, and error, you know, fits and misses and putting the pencil to the paper and just learning by doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't, you know, really underestimate how important that was in those early days. It's still important now. I decided that this was a journey that I was going to be uh, involved in. And I was going to force this to happen. I was very bullish on this. I was going to learn this. And I had a vision in my head of where I was going to be able to end up. Now, of course, as you probably know, that vision changes <laughs> as oh, yeah. you start creating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's changing and it's evolving and morphing. Mm -hmm. But I, I at least had something in my mind when I started. And I created a podcast then. So that mm -hmm. was my first form of teaching. That was back in 2015. 2015. I actually started in 2014. Wow. That's a long time ago. It was a long time ago, but mm -hmm. I looked around and I thought, you know, to myself, if I could just listen to a podcast about making art, that would be great. But there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and because I had this long commute to work, I sat there and did things that were uh, sometimes wrote a few times in, during, the, during the day. I had some downtime where I could actually listen to audio so i would listen to podcasts well that's early days too when i started doing that mm -hmm. so it was a medium i was very comfortable with and familiar with when i started trying to learn how to draw there was not an art podcast uh on drawing and how to create art and so i decided that i would create that and little did mm -hmm. i know that would lead to some bigger things and it was more of this, you know, dipping my toe into the water of teaching. I didn't know I was doing that either. All I thought to myself was someone else has got to be like me. How can I help other artists to understand some of the things that it took me so long mm -hmm. to acquire? Very good. All right. So that was the beginning of teaching, mm -hmm. right? A year later, I came out with the beginner's color pencil course. People have taken the course They've learned from uh, the course, and so they share that with others. I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I just reveal everything that was a, a mystery to me inside that course, and I mm -hmm. teach somebody how to understand this medium of colored pencil. I know you can do a lot with your day, but you choose to watch and listen to this podcast, and I appreciate it very much. If you find my podcast interesting and uh, fulfilling and helping you in your creative endeavors, please feel free to share it with your friends on social media or emailing the link to my podcast. I appreciate it very much. What do you think is the hardest thing to learn in colored pencil? Like, what did you address in that course? the biggest hurdle uh, to understanding how to create artwork and colored pencil, I feel like is knowing like being able to look and peer over someone's shoulder as they're creating it and know what it takes to get from this sketchy illustrative kind of stage all the way to this other side, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and at the beginning what we want to do is we want to stop too soon and we want to say it's complete before the values are dark enough before there's enough layers on the paper depending on which surface you're mm -hmm. on uh things like that but the biggest thing that separates some of the teaching that i do over in the sharpened artist academy is i am teaching fundamental skills about art creation mm -hmm. drawing how to draw and what i noticed was there's a separation then between what uh, is popular, I guess, in colored pencil, and that's to teach technique. Mm -hmm. When you learn how to create art, though, and you learn how to draw, and you learn with simple, minimalistic materials, then there isn't anything you can't create. And 
adding in color, if you've come from graphite or charcoal, using color now in colored pencil isn't that much different. The mm -hmm. principles remain the same, right? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I teach a number of other courses. My One of my biggest courses now is face value. It's a portrait course in colored pencil. So that face value course, though, has developed and uh, has been modified and changed. And it's, it's a gr growing and living type of course. I mean, it's still mm -hmm. being developed uh, every single year. So, and I'm excited about that one because I love to see what the artists do in there. It's very exciting to see, you know, what they create and, and the maturity that happens, you know, the development that happens with a student. Mm -hmm. uh, it's exciting to me to mm -hmm. see that. Did you uh, spend any time teaching locally, like one-on-one, um, on one, or you yep. started teaching online from the beginning? No. So I started teaching locally first. I, I guess okay. I should back up and say that. I started teaching at Hobby Lobby is where I started. Okay. And then I also started offering private lessons, and I did that a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. And I actually uh, I have continued to offer private lessons one-on-one uh, -on -one in person I'm talking about. So this mm -hmm. is pre-COVID, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I was doing that even before uh, I had fully developed uh, many of the courses that are inside the Sharpened Artist Academy. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing art mentoring online. So I connect with it floats in, a, in and around 50 students per month. I learn even, you know, feel a little guilty sometimes because I'm charging for that. But I'm learning how to be a better teacher mm -hmm. when I connect with students in that way. It would be nice if you share how you find those uh, students. Like what, what do you do to, sure. uh, to attract students? to your course or yeah. to your private lessons? It's happening quite organically. Uh, so I created a website. Mm -hmm. That's something I own, right? I created an email list. I own that. I, I own the, you know, I, I pay for it, but I own the, the URL, right? Where that mm -hmm. website is hosted. Um, I own the email list. That's how I communicate with my students and potential students. And then I also... Uh, did something consistent. Okay, so those are the the mm -hmm. the form. Those are the recipe uh, ingredients. Okay, mm -hmm. to have something in that particular formula working, uh, I think is necessary. That's the preparation, right? Mm -hmm. But there's something else that has to happen. You have to do something consistently over time, and and build it up. Uh, whether you want to, you know, you feel like it or not, you do this day in and day out or week in and week out or month in and month out, right? So I did a podcast. I did it every week. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it every week. Um, maybe for some, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, maybe for others, it's getting on TikTok or maybe for others, it's creating a magazine and within the colored pencil community. There's, you know, several magazines. Uh, maybe it's writing a book like you did, Veronica. Mm -hmm. So there is something you can do as an artist right now. And the lowest barrier to entry, I feel like, is writing a blog. There's something you can do that's consistent mm -hmm. and it will gain traction over time if you're consistent at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the biggest thing that helped me. Now I'm guessing on that, you know, a mm -hmm. little bit. But you've got to go where traffic is, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go where people are asking questions about colored pencil, they're curious about it, you know, they congregate in these areas and you get mm -hmm. in front of that traffic, then they can, they'll notice you and you can, you provide value to them. And then over time, uh, if you're consistent enough over time, that will start to uh, uh, they'll become students of yours. The, the other thing that I think isn't talked about a whole lot, and I think it's so critical and so important is you got to be prepared. When someone does contact that and they're saying, hey, I love this painting you did. How did you do this? You've got to be ready to be able to have a conversation with these people that are contacting you and be curious mm -hmm. about their development and their growth and just say, how can I help you? You know, I do offer private lessons if that's something you're interested in. And develop mm -hmm. that and nurture that, that relationship and those conversations. And really what that is, there, there's a sophisticated term in marketing uh, that talks about this. And it's a funnel is what it is. You know, it's, it's a nurturing 
of uh, this traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get all, um, you know, grossed out when we start talking about marketing. <laughs> but you if you're going to be an artist and you're going to make money, you've got to, and you're going to figure out ways to uh, use your craft to earn an income. Then you've got to figure out ways to enjoy marketing a little bit, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. It just, uh, the word marketing um, sounds very uh, separate from what we actually do. But uh, what I learned is that you need to think about it differently. Basically, uh, um, you need to decide how you want to help people. Right. And then it's not marketing. You just, uh, it comes from a different place because... Yes you want to help people uh, learning how to draw and then it becomes a lot easier to talk to art students and absolutely uh, yeah i couldn't agree more mm -hmm. yeah if you come from that mindset and you're asking yourself constantly how can i help an artist how can i help this person mm -hmm. uh yeah if you if you want to replace it with that you know that's the best thing to do i suppose because that's constantly what I'm asking myself. You're, you're mm -hmm. never going to make a difference if you're not, uh, if you don't have that in the forefront of your mind. How would this help another artist? My goal with this show is just to bring, you know, good content to people. Mm -hmm. sure. So how do you define success for yourself? You know, it maybe this might sound a little more woo-woo or esoteric, and I'm not meaning for it to be, but it, it's really defined by, uh, if I'm, I'm getting enough feedback from students, there's a, like this feedback loop, like I'm teaching, I'm putting things out there, mm -hmm. but if no one's responding to that and no one's saying, oh, this has really helped me, mm -hmm. I, I feel a little defeated about that. I feel like, well, that, that didn't work. You know, this is not helping anybody. I'm mm -hmm. not going to continue to do that, to do that very thing, you know, that I thought might work. But when I receive you know, emails, I get emails all the time about, oh, this particular thing you did really helped me. And now I understand how to see the values uh, mm -hmm. or now I understand how to uh, be able to render shadows really well or whatever the case may be. Or, oh, this particular podcast really opened up my eyes and helped me to understand what, you know, I didn't know before, that kind of thing. To me, it's helping other people, I guess, is mm -hmm. the biggest thing I want to say. Uh, if I'm doing that, it's less about making artwork. Uh, I do enjoy making artwork, but it's more about how can I help a student? And I enjoy that time so much. You know, there's a sense of community and that grows and that swells. And there's a lot of, you know, there's network effect going on. There's a lot of this um, mutual, you know, sharing the symbiotic thing that happens uh, to me, I guess I define success more in that way. It's not okay. about a monetary, um, you know, value that I can put on it. I can't quantify it like that. So what's your favorite colored pencil brand? Oh, I, I, uh, I have three that I love. Okay. <laughs> I love uh, Luminance mm -hmm. by Karen Dosh. I love the Polychromos line by favorite castell and i love the light fast line by derwent okay uh, those you know there's se there's several others that i love as well I love pablo's by karen mm -hmm. dosh as well but there's there's a bunch but those those three um and so well, and pablo's. explain why you love them i i also all, yeah i also love this uh lumens yeah, and they're so good. yeah they yeah. all kind of uh just like interact and, and play well together. If I need something that is uh, just, you know, a very hard uh, point uh, and I, I don't want it to, to break, I don't want a waxy buildup on the surface, then, you know, I'm going to grab polychromo sometimes and a mix of those, maybe Pablo, depending on where you are in the process. So right now I've been using Pastel Matte by Claire Fontaine quite a bit. That's one I really love. Uh, I also love sanded paper. I love Stonehenge quite a bit. Uh, Stonehenge, I think, is a good teacher uh, in the beginning when you're first learning, uh, if you're patient. And if you're doing color pencil, you're probably mm -hmm. patient. Um, and I think that it just teaches you by the very nature of, you know, the virtue of the fact that 
if you go too fast, you can, um, you know, create a mess, right? You can uh, burnish too quickly and things like that. But if you slow down and you enjoy that process, you can build up some very rich layers and create some very compelling artwork. And so I think it's a good teacher in the beginning. It teaches mm -hmm. you some principles that carry over to any other surface. I'm a little bit too impatient for it now. I, I just, I, I want to go to pastel mat a lot of times because it's quicker. So rendering. what's so special about this kind of uh, paper? Pastel mat? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can render very quickly, for one thing. Uh, it it fills up the tooth fairly quick, but it also, uh, it feels like it never ends. Like like you can keep adding layers if you want to. It, it's just, it's kind of a magical paper. So I feel that, like. <laughs> does it have uh, the texture? Yeah, have you not used it? You don't, you don't no, use it? No, I have, I have oh, I've never okay. used it. That's why okay. I'm, I'm curious. Um, the company itself calls it a cellulose layer. Uh, and to touch it, you know, to the touch, it's kind of a smooth layer. Mm -hmm. But as you rake the pencil across the surface, you notice uh, this tooth, this pronounced tooth, very fine. But it gives you more of this, I don't know, um, ethereal kind of feel to it. Very evenly distributed tooth. Uh, and you can create some very rich uh, colors on it and fill up that tooth quickly if you want to uh, and just burnish and and uh, start pressing really hard or you can go slow and treat it more like stonehenge but you can layer light over dark which is another mm -hmm. key i love i love being able to do that and that's more difficult to do on traditional papers uh, what's your favorite subject i mean i'm guessing but <laughs> you portraits yeah, yeah so why why do you like portraits? I just think that expressions, uh, facial features are dynamic. They're fascinating. Being able to look at a person and wonder about that particular individual is just a magical thing to, to wonder, you know, what, mm -hmm. what is it about this person? Why, you know, why, why are they, um, where they are, what, why do they look the way they do? What, you know, this is not just some empty shell. This, this is a person that has uh, experiences and has suffered happiness or loss and has had great joy in their life. And there's just something about, I think, the human condition. And we're curious by nature, I think, to want to understand others and mm -hmm. to relate to them. And sometimes, you know, it's something that you see in others, it helps you to understand yourself even better. I mm -hmm. just think they're fascinating. Find the person you want to draw or how do you pick the reference? I'm guessing you take your own pictures. I take my own references. Yes. Uh, I've hired models before. Um, I've begged, borrowed and pleaded with people to, to photograph them <laughs> so I could draw from them. Mm -hmm. I've approached strangers in the grocery store. It doesn't work out too well. Yeah, um, I've done all kinds of things. So what do you think works, uh, works best? Like in my experience, how do you work approaching strangers? <laughs> it has worked, but it, it, it's not. Yeah, you're right. It's not um, it's not easy for yeah. one. And yeah. um, they usually look at you suspiciously, which I don't blame <laughs> them. Um, I, you know, and I think that when you are are active, you have a social life and, and you do things, you develop relationships with people and mm -hmm. you, you know, you're a friend to people, you know, and we probably know more people than what we think we do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can, you can foster a connection between someone that you've seen or, you know, in the community and you know that they're associated with someone else or some other group. And you can, you can ask about that person once you find out their name, if you don't know their name. And, uh, and you try to get an introduction to that person. I mean, that, that, those are some of the ways that I've used. Another thing that I've thought about doing, I haven't done this yet, but I'm, I'm really tempted to do it. There is a, a biker um, area uh, not too far from my house, maybe 45 minutes or something. There is this, these guys that walk into uh, this establishment, and, uh, and I don't know what it is. I was driving. There's a gallery not too far from here. And I was driving by and I saw just like all these bikers and I've, I've oh, seen yeah. it more than once headed down this path. So I'm guessing maybe there's, I don't know, 
something over there, a restaurant or something or, or a uh, bar and grill or something that they love. I would love to, I see all these nice beards and I would love to, to get their attention and see if I can draw uh, mm -hmm. one or more of those individuals. But I, you know, I'll admit this is a tough thing. It's mm -hmm. hard. It's mm -hmm. very hard to try to find new subjects. Um, so do you sign a photo release with, with mm -hmm. a person or Absolutely. You, you don't? Yeah. yeah. Now okay. I, I have sketched people that I see in public and things like that. And mm -hmm. I don't get a, a signed photo release, but typically I, I do that. Uh, I always do that if it's something I'm going to teach, mm -hmm. uh, like I'm teaching my students mm -hmm. a particular model and their particular pose, then I always have a signed photo release. Yeah, I think that's very important just to protect yourself and the model. Like you think you're a friend and you develop a connection, but then... Right. Uh, this world is so uh, strange and unpredictable. Yeah, we do work, uh, we do art, uh, basically for the art's sake. We rely on our feelings to make a connection and uh, to build uh, a relationship. But then another person can take it very differently. And this is something that I, I learned in my practice. And so I think a photo release is a must if you want to be a portrait uh, painter, artist, and you take your own pictures. But I suspect that this is how I learned about that is listening to podcasts about photography i remember uh getting a lot of useful information and so that's probably veronica how i mm -hmm. ran across that idea but it made sense to me because look you know we don't you may we may feel like we know people uh mm -hmm. really well but like to your point they they can change tomorrow especially if something's just you know on uh you know we're going off feelings or we're going off a handshake or a head nod or something like that you know mm -hmm. that can change um anything can change, right? Uh, somebody um, just changes their mind, like mm -hmm. you said, and then all of a sudden, wow, you may have had their image in a book or in a course, uh, in my case, and all of a sudden they've changed their mind. If you don't have some kind of written documentation to back that up, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a scary thing. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, one of the things that I, I learned is that it's totally legal to take pictures uh, of anyone um, mm -hmm. outside. You can snap a picture and you yeah. can draw from it. Right. Um, because it's your freedom to do it. And they're it. in the public. Yeah. 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 And they, they, have, um, they have foregone their freedom of that particular type of privacy when they yeah. uh, are out there in the public. The thing is, I just want to have that double layer of protection yeah. and I'm using their image mm -hmm. to present that to students uh, or to put that into a course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. For if the, for yeah. If the image is, uh, if the photograph is inside yes. a course, then yes, you, you must have yeah. a release, but otherwise you can snap pictures and no one can really um, right. tell, tell you what to do. What would be your dream project or legacy project do you have any oh it's such a lofty question isn't it let me think for a second um that's a good one i mean i i have i have a project that uh, i've been working on for years I, i've got a lot of photo references for it and are you familiar with uh rembrandt's painting called the anatomy lesson You've got he's got a, like eight or nine guys um, looking at a cadaver on the table, and uh, oh. <laughs> so all these medical students, you know, are looking at this anyway. Oh, uh, you you mean the painting itself? Yeah, the painting itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah of and, course. Uh, so I'm wanting to. <laughs> it might sound silly, but I'm wanting to recreate that in uh, colored pencil um, okay. with some modern things, and I'm fascinated with that intersection of technology and humanity and so mm -hmm. i'm gonna do something with that with regard to um you know people and technology so okay. and uh, it, it it's more of a derivative work of rembrandt yeah that's how that's, interesting uh, wow yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i also have some bodies of of work that uh, you know i that i want to do i fantasize about doing it am i ever, ever going to get to it Maybe, but maybe not to the scale that I think that I'm going to be able to get uh, accomplished. You know, I'm so busy 
um, creating, you know, information and, and courses for uh, students. So I'm, I'm not sure I'll ever get to a lot of these things, but I would like to. Yeah. Okay. So why that painting? Why uh, the cadaver? Yeah. <laughs> well, and so I'm going to be the cadaver in that, in that particular oh, oh, wow. uh, uh, painting. And uh, I, I, I've always been compelled uh, to this, this gaze that people will have of something far away or far off or this curiosity kind of expression on people's face. And that's what's going on in this painting. And, um, you know, I, I just think that captivating that and I mean, let's face it, Rembrandt was a master at, uh, and many of the old masters were at just creating this, this movement in the composition where you're staying engaged in there. Mm -hmm. But I love it that he's taking something that is so mundane, really. I mean, this is just, this is a, a lesson for medical students, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing the same thing with, um, with, with some technology in there. I'll, I'll just leave it at that for right okay. now. <laughs> in the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that um, we as artists need to get in front of traffic mm -hmm. and um, we could create our own blog. Yeah, I, I actually do some business mentoring uh, for some students, uh, not very many, just a, just a few at a time. They usually contact me first and then, and then we go through that. And I, I talk about it very granular um, steps that, that someone can take to try to build up their business. I'm not a writer. I'm not a blogger. You know, that's mm -hmm. just not something, you know, that I'm, I'm good at. I'm not, I don't do that very well. That's why I have a podcast. I'd mm -hmm. rather talk and uh, share that way. But there are some very talented writers who happen to also be artists, you know, and that's a very good medium for them. Mm -hmm. the, the, really, the message, Veronica, that I just want to put out there for anybody who they're, maybe they were stuck in a corporate job like I was. To, they love art. They love creating art. They're wanting to get out of there. They're wanting to start doing this side business as their full-time thing. Do something consistently that you're good at and that you love mm -hmm. and do it over and over and over again, longer than anyone else will do it. And if you stand out in that way, then you've done something extraordinary. Okay. You can take something ordinary, but if you do it differently than in everyone else and being consistent and doing something as a marathon run and not a sprint sets you apart mm -hmm. and you can do something like blogging. And you may think, oh, blogs are, you know, that's so uh, old, you know, no one does that anymore. But I can, I can point to people that do that all the time. Maybe they do it daily or weekly or monthly. Just make it the best thing that you can make it. Make it as good as you can and keep working at it and do it consistently over and over again. And what happens when you do that? Well, the search engine uh, juice goes up. You know, Google's able to index your website so much easier. You've got those keywords that you're trying to hit because you're wanting to help artists. You're not going to help anybody if they don't know where you are, right? You have mm -hmm. to be able to hit the key words that matter to you that you know will help someone. So write articles that actually help a student and they'll keep coming back and they'll want to learn what you're able to teach them. Okay. So to summarize, an artist needs to understand what his or her gift is. And yeah, then they, they, because and, we're not all good at everything, right? Right. And then do you <laughs> consistently? <laughs> I podcast consistently. Yeah. If you understand yourself and you know what you're, you're able to do uh, consistently and repetitively mm -hmm. and do it and show up and keep doing it, then you're going to set yourself apart from everyone else. If you want to make money at this and you don't want to uh, just have a gallery system uh, control your income level and, uh, you know, and you don't want to be beholden to the algorithm over on YouTube or on, um, you know, TikTok or something like that, you know, and, and you, you may be saying, you may be thinking about that and saying, well, John, you are, you're uh, subject to the algorithm over there on the podcast, wherever you put the podcast. And it's true. 
but I also own the feed, the RSS feed, and I have it on my website. Mm -hmm. So if you have a blog, you own that as well. If you have a YouTube channel, um, it, it's not a YouTube channel, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're putting out videos that are, that's helping somebody. You can have that live anywhere. You could mm -hmm. host that yourself if you wanted to see what happens, you know, see if you like to write every week or every month or something. Mm -hmm. See if you like to create videos and it doesn't have to be a lot. I mean, you don't, you don't have to say, okay, this is this huge thing. I don't know how I'm going to be able to buy the cameras and get set up with everything. You can use your iPhone, if you've got a good iPhone or some kind of smaller camera at the beginning, create some videos, see if they help somebody, see what happens and just mm -hmm. try it out. And I, I guarantee you that you'll have some momentum. You'll find out what you like and what you don't like. So try a few things. You have to be a curator, right? Before you're a creator. That's what I like to, to think about. Like I have to try some things and maybe I'm not going to be good at some of these, but there's going to be a few that'll rise to the top. And then I want to narrow in on those things that one, I'm passionate about, I'm good at, you know, and two, it's actually going to help somebody. What do you think of art contests? Do you think they're important for artists or it's just a waste of time? I guess it depends on your goals. Uh, for, for me, I don't enter a lot of contests. Mm -hmm. um, I figured out pretty early on that I do enter some, you know, and I, and I think they're good. I think they're really good. And it depends on your goals. But I figured out early on that I don't like I'm not uh, motivated a whole lot by a lot of accolades like mm -hmm. that. I, I'm more motivated by, um, you know, I like I like creating art but I'm more motivated by helping others, by helping a student, mm -hmm. by helping someone understand and get some of those epiphanies and those um, revelation moments, you know, that happen whenever you just start creating art and exploring and, and just being creative and figuring things out. Uh, if I can help to conceptualize that and put that into, you know, a PDF booklet form, like I do in the courses or in video chunk size videos that help someone step by step walk through something, then that lights me up more than entering a show. But I will say this, that if you're wanting to sell your work and you're wanting to get in front of collectors and you're wanting to maybe, uh, you know, approach a gallery or something that that helps and build up that CV, the resume and have a list of, of these accomplishments, uh, submit to magazines and, you know, have something you can show someone to say, Hey, here's a little bit of street cred. You know, I'm not just brand new at this. I've been doing this mm -hmm. for a while. I think shows are fun to be in contests are a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think too early in the beginning, Veronica, people use those uh, to either pump themselves up. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes it can, it can inflate your, your own view of, of what's really going on with your work. And, and it can start to create this problem where someone decides not to grow anymore. <laughs> to me, that would just be death. I would, I would hate to, to get to that point where someone said, okay, you don't need to grow anymore. You don't need to learn anything. Cause I love to learn and I love to keep developing my own particular style and, and artwork. Right. Mm -hmm. But the second thing that can happen is it can be deflating and defeating. And I hate seeing that where someone might be newer mm -hmm. and they submit something to a show, it doesn't get accepted or, uh, you know, they receive like uh, something that they would consider to be, you know, a rebuke or something. They see mm -hmm. someone's comment about their work. And I just hate that, that, you know, that, that it's like this, this big grand arbiter uh, that is going to decide whether or not, your art is good or bad, you know, mm -hmm. that's a part of the show that I don't like. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a double-edged sword because it can it be is. very encouraging. It, it is. I, I think it depends where you are as an artist, as an artist. And also it depends if you are okay with rejection because rejection hurts. And yeah. yeah, if um, you're not able to deal with that, it's better not to enter Right. But at the same time, uh, there are some contests that can bring you a recognition, traffic, yeah. and authority. That, yes, yes. That, no, and I agree with that, yeah. 
Yeah. But I also don't want to be in competition with my students. Mm -hmm. I encourage them to enter shows if it's a good fit for them and if it's something they want mm -hmm. to do. But I don't want to be submitting my work and then have them feel like I'm in competition with them. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't help. Them. I want to be their cheerleader. I want to help them grow and develop. That's my role. That's something mm -hmm. I love to do. And I love to help others to push them in these areas if they if they want to do that. Yeah, personally, I rarely enter the competitions. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I used to be up, very upset about it. Now it doesn't, oh, did it doesn't make that much difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I win once in a while, but it's not constant. So I think um, the problem with the art world is that it's very random, even mm -hmm. when we enter the competitions that might be a good fit yeah. um, you can see that some of the winning work is weak and other work is very strong right right but it could be flipped in like the first place could be taken by weak work yeah, yeah. while uh, the third place would be taken by a strong work you and so yeah and yeah. um the, this could be frustrating yeah. um, but at the same time top contests can uh, bring you traffic recognition oh, yeah. and, and authority that yes. um, I think we all need as artists to stand out as well mm -hmm. um, yeah no I think they're a good thing uh, for depending on your purpose and what, what mm -hmm. you're really wanting to accomplish if you put all of your uh self-esteem in a show yeah, exactly it can be very defeating yeah exactly like i don't cry over it anymore that yeah because yeah. my self-esteem is not defined by a contest but you're right you're yeah right. and i think if a, if an artist is not able to separate like his or her self-esteem from winning or losing then it's a big problem yes mm -hmm. but yeah, otherwise absolutely. Yeah. Well, early on when, you know, just like anybody else, I mean, in the beginning when I was creating art, if I submitted to a show and I didn't get in, I, I was, I was just very down. I was mm -hmm. very low at that point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, today that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. And having judged shows in the past too, I, I understand it's, it's an opinion. That's it. That's all mm -hmm. it is. It's very random. And yeah. th the thing is about art that like I don't like is the fact that when we go and listen to music, you know, the artist needs to hit the notes. We, we are not going to listen a terrible. Um, the concophony. Of yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Barraged uh, with yeah. no logic to the or, or, music. Of sounds, you know, you need to be a good musician. You know, you need to play well. But in art, whatever goes. So there is no That's standard funny. or... Um, I make that comparison all the time. I, I agree with you. You can talk about music. You can say that, you know, the pitch uh, matters, mm -hmm. the, the tempo matters, you know, the timing and rhythm, all that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're singing, then uh, breaths matter, you know, rests in the music. But what's most important out of all of those, if we're talking about something that, you know, is appealing to probably 90% of the people that are listening, the pitch, the pitch, you have to be on pitch, you know, if you're singing, mm -hmm. especially. You gotta be on pitch, right? So in art, what are what's the comparison there? It's it has to be kind of accurate, you know, if we're talking yeah. about representational art. <laughs> so yeah, that that's just that's something I, I don't know. It's fun to talk about, but yeah, uh, I wonder if it's going to change over time or not. Um, and I think a lot of you think it, it will. I'm just curious. Uh, how do I know? I think it all yeah. depends on education. I think if we expand art education like art appreciation in uh, public schools mm. and it would grow over yeah. time yeah. Be because then a, a lot more people would be exposed to art like yeah. you said you you grew up in a rural community yeah what town was it in Oklahoma uh it was a, a suburb of well so down the southwest corner of Oklahoma Frederick um, okay. and Davidson. Okay. So probably no one has ever heard of it. But anyway, I was like 
two to three hours from any major city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was no art, you know, there, mm -hmm. I mean, there, they would have like some contests. Like I remember in grade school that uh, was going on, you know, far away at a different school. And they would say, if you guys, you know, if you have anything you want to enter, mm -hmm. then you can enter it here. You know, you can go ahead and enter that show. And I would enter those, you know, from time to time. You know, I, I would enter those, but I didn't have like this, this instruction from art class, never mm -hmm. had art class. So they just didn't offer it. You know, those were some of the first things to go art and mm -hmm. music, right? Yeah. And I think if those things would be changed, then more mm -hmm. people would be exposed and, you know, basically grow their art appreciation. Over time, the whole idea of art would change as well. Yeah, no, I agree that. But it's something to be seen. Yeah, right. uh, is there anything else you'd like to share before we quit? So I, I just want to say something, though, to a beginner colored pencil artist. If they're just starting out on this journey and they're wanting to learn, first off, I, I would say I would congratulate you on this journey, uh, on making this resolve that you do want to learn this medium. I love this medium. Uh, it's, it's the best medium out there. It is the best in the world according to my opinion here, book of, a book of John, right? But um, <laughs> I would also say then, find some accountability, you know, tr find a trusted mentor and have a feedback loop on your work. Someone who can be a little more objective, you know, than you and your family, right? And then also get in community, have a community of people, some others who are going through some of the same things that you're going through and encountering some of the same pitfalls that you're encountering. And that, that it's so motivating when you do that. And when I look back at my journey, it's one of the things I wish I would have changed. I would, I would have done is I would have sought out a mentor and I'm not talking about mm -hmm. paying for a mentor, although that is, that will shortcut your process quite a bit, but I'm talking about just uh, being able to watch someone else's process. You know, maybe you get Veronica's book, or something, you know, you, you find mentors and you can be mentored from afar, right? By not having to know that person or that person doesn't know you, but you know that person's work. Mm -hmm. Find someone though, whose, whose work you admire and you want to emulate for a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it goes back to that thing, you know, copy before you create, you mm -hmm. know, curate before you create and, and find the different styles and approaches that you enjoy and work at that for a while. Those three things I think are very important. Accountability, feedback loop on your work, and community. Yeah, very good. And I agree with you. Uh, mentorship is the most important thing. This is something that I missed out on uh, throughout my life. And I think two things for me that I missed out on. And I, the first thing is mentorship. I think it's mm -hmm. super important. Yeah, I think I it, it's super important to find um, an artist whom you admire. And also like that artist is supposed to have a very good business practice. Yeah. And, and then you just learn from, from that person. Yeah. The old fashioned way. <laughs> Putting in the reps, I tell you, there, yeah. there's nothing that can replace doing the work, going through the heartaches of mess, making mistakes and messing up. You learn more by that than mm -hmm. anything else. So awesome. One more question I had and I forgot to ask. Oh, no. Uh, how, uh, how do you uh, pick guests for your podcast? Oh, man, that, that is a trade secret. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. No, 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 it's not. Um, I'm just teasing. It's tough to answer, though, because I'm really looking for uh, someone who I feel like shows a it has to be good work. Right. I'm looking for someone who is producing good work. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also looking for something a little bit different. Like I'm probably not going to ask a person that is uh, just creating floating head uh, drawings of dogs. Right or floating head, whatever, or, or is creating uh, still life with no background at all, or something like that, if I can be nitpicky for a second. But I'm probably going to ask someone if they're doing that and adding something else in there that is so different and compelling and pushing the limits. 
of color, either colored pencil or drawing or something similar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or they have something that they're doing out here um, that is so compelling and would be helpful uh, in a different art medium, but we can cross-reference, right, right? And we can learn from what they may be doing over in, I don't know, oil paints or pastels or something like that. And we can apply some of those things to colored mm -hmm. pencil. Well, I listened to quite a few uh, podcasts and uh, what I noticed about yours is that um, you also invite guests from brands that... Oh, right. Uh, how, how do you invite guests like that? Um, or do well, they so, approach you? To well, be so it's show? been a mix of both. Like, for instance, if we talk about income streams, you know, with mm -hmm. uh, regard to what, you, what an artist could do, that's what happened after I was consistent with creating the podcast. Over mm -hmm. time, I've had brands uh, that would approach me and ask me to advertise now. I've not always said yes either. Um, you know, it's sometimes it has to be a good fit for the show has to be something that I like, believe in or use, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe all three, um, but it has to be good for the audience. First and foremost, it has to be something that's a good fit for them. It's happened sort of uh, pretty organically. I mean, Amazon approached me about um, some advertising on the podcast. So it, it could happen like that as well, not just searching for it. Well, in my experience, when you run after something, it doesn't work. Yeah. But when you do something with passion, uh, yeah. pe people come. And so yeah. it's, it's important to have the patience. Uh, do, do the right things, but yeah. have the patience and everything kind of aligns together at some point. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Yeah. Some, I tell you, some of my best guests have come from other guests who've been on the show, but from my students, the ones that say, mm -hmm. hey, I admire this person's work. Could you interview them on the podcast? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'll, I'll get people asking that uh, sometimes, you know, and, and those have been some of the best guests, really. Well, John, I appreciate you being on my show. Oh, thank you so much. This was my pleasure for sure. I, I really appreciate it. I'm flattered that uh, you would have me on the show. Okay. All right. So, so. Nice chatting with you, John. You as well. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. And thanks so much for watching and listening. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.